Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's happy Wednesday. Um, and today it gives me really great pleasure to, to introduce Steve to you, who's going to talk to us about marine EM methods. But before I do, I'd just like to remind you about the MNR program. You can go on the website and you'll see MNRs that are coming. Uh, and I've, I've just put some up today, just arranged a few others with, with speakers through uh, 2022. And uh, you'll see a registration link where you can log on and, and register for the MNR. And then past MNRs, you'll see a video link and a presentation. And uh, this, this video from Steve will be available in a couple of hours. You're on a, a webinar, so um, that means you can send questions, Q&A, um, and the presenter might answer them on the flyer at the end of the webinar. And then towards the end, if you want to raise your hand, if you want to speak uh, verbally um, in the webinar. So Steve Constable, uh, Steve and I were just reminiscing. We go back to uh, November 1979 when we met for the first time um, in Sydney at the rented house of Nigel Edwards. And then we immediately went off to the middle of nowhere, Cobar in New South Wales to do some MMR studies. So I've known Steve a long time, um, particularly for four months I spent at Scripps in uh, 87 when, when Steve was hosting me there. So Steve, uh, as you know, very prominent in the EM game. Um, got his PhD at uh, Australian National University in 83 with uh, Ted Lilly, and is the Distinguished Professor of Geophysics at Scripps. Steve's interested in all aspects of conductivity. You'll see many of his papers in all sorts of different areas. Uh, inverse theory, of course, the uh, Occam method, uh, the first to bring regularization into MT, electrical properties of rocks, work with Aldouba and such, mantle conductivity, magnetic satellite induction, global lightning instrumentation. Main focus is marine electromagnetic methods. Uh, Steve, as you know, was, was very involved from the beginning, from the outset of commercializing marine EM for hydrocarbons and played a very important role. And we'll hear about that. And Steve has received a number of uh, appropriate uh, accolades through his career. The Rex T. Prindam Medal, uh, Holman Award, R&D 100 Award, S SEG Distinguished Lecturer, SEGs, Reginald Fasson, Fassenden and Distinguished Achievement Award and uh, AGU Fellow. So without further ado, uh, Steve, if you want to share your screen and, and uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Um, okay, as advertised, I'm gonna talk about uh, um, Marini M. Um, it's not a comprehensive review. Um, I've written several review papers, if you want that. It's, um, it's a story of the evolution um, told from largely a Scripps perspective, which is where I've um, spent my career. Uh, and also um, it has basically been a large part of the history of uh, Marine M. So let me get back my magic wand. Okay. And um, so this is an EM in R, and so I'm assuming that um, if you're here, you know the basics of uh, EM methods. Um, so I'm going to talk about the application in the marine environment of both um, controlled source EM, often just called EM methods, and uh, the magnetotelluric method, uh, which uses a natural source field. And both can be applied to the marine environment. Um, they're somewhat complementary. Um, the CSEM method has higher resolution in the shallow crust and is preferentially sensitive to resistors. And the magnetotelluric method um, allows one to go much deeper in the earth and is uh, preferentially sensitive to um, conductors. So um, marine EM is actually quite a young field, um, and as is usual, theory predates practice. Uh, Louis Cagnard uh, actually mentioned using uh, uh, MT in the marine environment in his seminal 1953 paper uh, introducing the magnetotelluric method, 
Um, but it wasn't until 1965 that Chip Cox with his students, uh, Jean Few and Jimmy Larson, um, made the first deep water marine MT measurements. The early EM work was largely carried out by the British and the uh, US navies for um, um, mine detection and um, ship detection, submarine detection and so on. And the first um, paper uh, proposing um, Marine EM as we now know it, it was probably this paper by Peter Bannister that came out of the Navy Underwater Sound Lab. Um, again, it wasn't until 1979 that uh, Chip made the first deep water uh, CSEM measurements using the dipole, the electric field dipole dipole method proposed by Bannister. And it's not clear, I don't think Chip was aware of this paper. I don't think he was reading geophysics because he wasn't a geophysicist. Um, he was uh, famous as an oceanographer um, for his work on ocean microstructure. So the interesting question is why um, was Chip interested in marine EM in the first place? And the answer is that he was impressed by some work of Gunter Wertheim um, who was measuring the um, ocean transport of the uh, water currents through the Florida Straits using a, a telephone cable. And this is an idea actually that dates back to Michael Faraday on um, water flowing through um, the Earth's magnetic field creates an electric field through the Lorentz force. It's the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field. So the vertical component of the magnetic field and the horizontal velocity of water in this case creates an electric field that you can measure with the uh, um, telegraph cables. So he decided he wanted to do this. He had a, a postdoc to uh, Japan and he worked with uh, Choshihiku Teramoto um, with some uh, um, telephone cables running from the Izu Peninsula. But um, the first hurricane that came along um, destroyed all the equipment. Um, so when he got back to Scripps in California, uh, he tried running cables from the Farallon Islands in uh, Northern California, um, and the first winter storms destroyed the equipment again. So it was like building a castle on a swamp in the famous movie. Um, he decided that running cables through the surf zone was a losing proposition and he needed measurements on the seafloor. So um, his student Jean Fiu uh, was developing seafloor magnetometers. And in 1960, his friend and colleague Ulrich Schmucker was visiting Scripps uh, to deploy land magnetometers near the coast to study the coast effect, which I will talk about later. And so Chip had this idea that he would deploy um, a marine extension to Schmucker's magnetometer array using Jean's magnet uh, magnetometers, and he would also deploy electric field uh, receivers to start his uh, efforts to study ocean, ocean currents. And the, um, the timing was right. In 1949, Teddy Bullard visited Scripps to develop heat flow instruments and he had, he had been exposed to O-rings during the war in the aerospace business, and he introduced O-rings to oceanography. Now we take these little pieces of rubber for granted now, um, but they were in fact, and still are critical to making measurements in high pressure apparatus on the, uh, on, on the ocean. So Chip was aware of O-rings. The problem was actually recording data. And the solution, was this thing called a rust track recorder, which is a mechanical chart recorder. Um, and he triggered it using a uh, Bulova tuning fork watch. Um, and he achieved the incredible sample rates of 15 measurements an hour. But this resulted in the first deep water magnetotelluric response ever made. Uh, this is from a paper by Chip Cox, Jean Few and Jimmy Larson. This is uh, Jimmy Larson. Um, and uh, you can see the phase and the E over B response um, that characterizes the MT method. So by now, Chip was most interested in the electrical connectivity of the seafloor because his oceanographic measurements um, had to be calibrated by how much current leaked into the conductive seafloor instead of being trapped in the ocean. He also realized that if the um, seafloor was uh, as resistive as he guessed correctly it would be, um, then there would be a boundary zone 
associated with the interruption of the electric fields at the uh, coastline. And the distance of this boundary zone was proportional to the product of the lateral conductance of the seawater and the transverse resistance of the upper crust and, uh, and the crust and, uh, and upper mantle. Um, and uh, he estimated that this compensation or boundary zone uh, distance could be thousands of kilometers. So the entire oceans were um, influenced by it. Um, one dimensional magnetotelluric measurements would be um, useless. And uh, he really wanted to know just uh, how resistive the seafloor was. And um, to measure such a resistive seafloor, he needed something other than MT methods, which not only were affected by this boundary zone, um, but also were, were not uh, sensitive to um, high re resistors trapped between two conductors. So he started off by trying to make measurements on the seafloor of energy that had propagated from land. So he first of all tried to detect human resonance off Baja California near a steep part of the continental shelf um, without any luck. And then he tried again in 1976, um, taking advantage of a large transmitter that Francis Bostic had set up near the coast in Washington state. And again, no luck. And as Chip relates in a 2011 Maralek meeting, uh, it had become clear to him that he needed an electromagnetic source on the seabed if he was going to understand the connectivity of seabed rocks in the deep ocean. Um, so his opportunity to do this came uh, about uh, from, the, from the RISE project. Um, this was a large multidisciplinary project headed up by uh, Fred Spies out of Scripps. And uh, Fred Spies had bought a, um, a, a, an electromechanical tow cable to hang a camera near the seafloor um, and take photographs. And um, this RISE project is famous for discovering um, black smokers, hydrothermal vents at mid-ocean ridges. And Chip could tow his transmitter using this cable that Fred Spies had bought. And he made the first measurements in 3,000 meters of water um, with um, near, the, uh, near the East Pacific rise. But um, it wasn't right on the ridge because he was dragging his transmitter antenna across the seafloor and he needed a patch of sediment to do that. Um, but he still detected uh, signals 19 kilometers away from the transmitter. Um, remarkably, within two years of making that first measurement, Chip had proposed to Exxon um, the idea of using marine CSEM as a direct detection for hydrocarbons. Um, I discovered this proposal in Chip's office after he died, and I was searching his office to make sure nothing important was lost. And it's a proposal to Exxon for um, electromagnetic surveying of oil fields. And a picture in that proposal um, shows the uh, EM response of what I, what's almost identical to what I've started to call the canonical oil field model, 100 ohm meters, 100 meter thick layer of oil buried a kilometer deep. Um, and his um, response was hand drawn, but I checked the calculations and, uh, and, and it is indeed correct. Um, but of course the proposal was declined because Chip was years ahead of his time and uh, the exploration hadn't yet progressed into deep water. So I joined Scripps to work as a postdoc for CHIP in 1983, and that started my um, apprenticeship in the dark arts of Marine EM under CHIP's guidance. Um, not too soon after I uh, started at Scripps, uh, Martin Sinner of Cambridge University, a seismologist, had decided that uh, he uh, wanted to expand his geophysical repertoire and do Marine EM over ridges. And so he, uh, he got the funding to develop a, a Marine EM capability similar to Scripps, except instead of dragging the transmitter antenna across the seafloor, um, he designed it to be flown above the rough rocks of, uh, of a mid ocean ridge. Um, around the same time, Nigel Edwards was working on a marine version of the magnetometric resistivity method that. Uh, um, Alan mentioned he used in uh, Cobar in Australia, among other things. Um, this, with, this took advantage of uh, Laurie Law's ability to uh, deploy C4 magnetometers. It's, um, it's, it's not an inductive method, it's, a, it's mainly a resistivity method, but it, it was used a few times on, on mid-ocean ridges. 
We also, just after I arrived at Scripps, obtained some funding from the oil industry to develop the EM methods. Um, but um, the funding was tied to oil prices. And uh, when the oil price dropped in 1986, the funding disappeared as well. And the sort of modern age of industry interest in Marini Am um, dates to around 1995, um, when uh, an a small industry consortium funded uh, um, Frank Morrison and Mike Hoverston of Berkeley, Arnie Orange of AOA Geophysics and myself at Scripps to develop the Marini Am method for exploration on the uh, continental shelves. Um, and this time the funding wasn't driven by the price of oil, which was quite low, but the high cost of deep water wells. So the blue line is uh, the number of wells in the Gulf of Mexico that were drilled in more than a thousand meters of water. And the, uh, these tension leg platforms allowed production in deep water, but the cost of drilling was high, 100 million, 200 million dollars. And the seismic method was having trouble in areas um, of salt, carbonate, and volcanic rocks where you get uh, large reflections and reverberations. And so the industry was looking for um, another method to um, map these um, um, rocks, which turned out to be coincidentally resistive. And so it, our initial funding was to develop a way of mapping salt bodies in the Gulf of Mexico. And this picture here is from Kerry Key's PhD thesis um, of the Gemini salt body in the Mississippi Canyon area of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, that was MT. Um, the industry got, industry got interested in CSEM around the turn of the century. And the first measurements were made over a prospect off Angola called Girasol, um, which means uh, sunflower. Um, and uh, they used Southampton's transmitter and Scripps receivers. Um, and uh, it was a success. We saw elevated electric fields over the, over the known reservoir. And Girasol is the canonical reservoir. It's a big chunk of oil. Um, ExxonMobil um, followed shortly after uh, using 30 new instruments that I had been uh, um, commissioned to build for them. Um, and they surveyed a couple of prospects um, off Angola. Um, this top prospect was a known oil field and um, you can see that the electromagnetic response follows the model with the reservoir in it and is again, like Girasol, elevated over the background with no oil. Um, they also surveyed a prospect prior to drilling that they had identified using seismics. Um, and here the uh, EM um, results were rather pessimistic. Um, and they followed the uh, um, brine field model and the two models with uh, two different hydrocarbon reservoirs um, did not fit the data. So it was pretty clear that from an EM perspective, this was going to be a dry well and they did uh, drill it uh, at a cost of probably more than $100 million and it was indeed a dry well. So why did the seismologists think that they had a hydrocarbon? Um, the problem with seismology is that a small amount of gas in the pore space reduces the seismic velocities a lot. So they see bright reflections from this stuff that's colloquially called fizz gas. But a few bubbles in the pore space isn't going to change the resistivity much. And it's not until you displace the pore fluids with a significant fraction of oil or gas that the reservoir target gets resisted. So this means that marine CSEM can be used to assess targets prior to drilling. And, uh, and, and indeed it was. Um, by the end of 2002, um, there were three contractor companies offering Marini M as a commercial project. Uh, EMGS was a spin-off from Statoil. Ohm Surveys was a spin-off from Southampton. Uh, and AOA Geomarine, uh, which was later bought by Sean Leger, um, was a spin off of Arnie Orange's uh, AOA Geophysics. And it even got to the point where custom build ships were uh, commissioned for purely marine EM work, um, which would have, which sort of would have blown my mind when I was doing the early MT work. I remember well Arnie Orange um, joking about a custom built seismic ship that was driving past our little our work boat while we were doing marine MT 
um, saying that's you know that's how the big boys get to ride, um, and we actually we actually got there. Um, well, as you probably know, um, offshore exploration is very much in decline, um, and um, the oil industry has uh, contracted at least in terms of um, frontier exploration, which is which is where geophysics plays a part. But this association of work with industry and the uh, inf influx of money that the industry put into the business has helped um, build a state-of-the-art instrument fleet uh, at Scripps. And so by collaborating with industry, I was able to build a fleet of 50 seafloor uh, MTEM receivers and uh, two 500 amp transmitters. And we got to use, we, we, we've used these instruments for a large number of academic studies. Um, and then Schlumberger decided that they couldn't really make money from Marine EM. Um, the Marine EM is a difficult uh, area to work in as a contractor. It's too capital intensive, witness the custom built ships for small companies, but for the big seismic companies, it really wasn't making that much money. Um, so it's, uh, it's a difficult niche to fill and Schlumberger decided to stand their fleet down and I managed to convince them to donate their instruments, more than 100 instruments to scripts, which, which uh, inflated my fleet to about 150. Um, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about what is different about uh, Marine EM compared to Land EM. Um, first of all, because you're working in the conductive seawater, the transmitters and, and indeed the receivers can be continuously towed. So you can do air, airborne EM with magnetic sources on land, um, you can do uh, something similar in the ocean with uh, electric field uh, sources and receivers. Um, you can measure the vertical electric field and it is indeed useful. Um, and because of the high connectivity of seawater, um, electric field transmitters are favorable. You can, without too much trouble, get 100,000 amp meter dipole moments on an electric field antenna which would be very hard with a, with a magnetic field antenna. Um, the time domain, which is very useful on land because the airwave dissipates with the speed of light is less useful in water because um, the late time asymptote goes to the DC seawater response and the um, seafloor signature is in the early time part of your time domain response. Um, and in shallow water where you might think um, the time domain has an advantage, um, Dylan Connell and Kerry Key showed that you just have a logistical disadvantage of uh, stacking times um, because you need to, because of the conductive seawater, you have to have at least 10 seconds of off time, which means your stacking time is reduced. And these pseudo random binary sequences, which are um, um, generate the equivalent of an impulse response, um, also scatter the energy across a very broad spectrum. But in reality, we've discovered that you only need a couple of frequencies um, for your inversions before you end up with diminishing returns. So um, the, um, the industry and myself um, favor these um, um, short binary waveform sequences that produce a lot of high harmonics in the first decade or so of the frequency spectrum. For magnetotellurics, the biggest effect is the loss of high frequency signal from the overlying conductive seawater. So if you work out uh, how big the uh, electric and magnetic fields are on the seafloor uh, compared to the uh, land or sea surface uh, spectrum, uh, you get a, a lot of attenuation. Um, so um, the, orange, the, the yellow line is for the uh, continental shelf sediments with about a thousand um, meters of water. And the blue line is for the deep ocean uh, 4,000 meters of water and a, a more resistive volcanic seafloor. And you see you get a large uh, attenuation, especially in the magnetic field because this, the resistive seafloor tends to produce a, um, a, a bigger attenuation. And so you end up crossing the noise floor of your induction coil magnetometers at uh, around uh, tens of seconds in the deep ocean and around one hertz in the uh, continental shells. Um, of course, if you work in very shallow water, you can get um, a broadband response similar to what you would on land, um, but you have to deal with uh, wave noise. 
So um, what, gravity waves, water waves rolling across the sea surface are moving water through the Earth's electric field, just as uh, Chip was interested in studying. Um, and it's also uh, wobbling your magnetometers in the Earth's magnetic field. And so you can end up with uh, um, some really noisy data around eight seconds period, which is the period of uh, wind waves. Um, fortunately, it's a relatively narrow band phenomenon. And as long as your instruments don't end up saturating, um, you, uh, you can get good data um, away from the wave noise. Even in deep water, water, water motion is a problem um, in the form of tidal currents. So you can see here we have a week or two's data. Um, these are spectrograms. So this is frequency in, uh, against time. Um, and you can see this noise coming in at long periods that is basically modulated by the tidal cycle. Um, and uh, at some point it starts to wobble the instrument. So uh, we have a resonant peak uh, of, on our instruments just above a hertz and you can, you can, you can see that water motion um, is, is wobbling the instrument. So you have, to, you have to deal with this sort of noise all the time. Um, and then there's the coast effect. Now, the, uh, the land side coast effect is manifest as a um, strengthening of the vertical magnetic field near the coastlines. Um, and um, this was observed by Rikitaki, um, but first associated with the oceans by Dudley Parkinson. Um, and uh, he, he's famous for um, the Parkinson vector or Parkinson arrow. Um, which he invented basically as a uh, means of illustrating the um, coast effect from uh, coastal magnetic observatories. Um, and the, uh, for a two-dimensional coastline, this is essentially a TE mode phenomenon where the electric currents um, flow along strike. So, um, so, the, so the electric currents flowing in the ocean parallel to the coast uh, create vertical magnetic fields on land. On the ocean side, the, um, the horizontal magnetic field can actually go to zero. Um, and that creates uh, these cusps. If you, if you take uh, E over B and B is zero, your apparent resistivity is going to produce a singularity. So you see these cusps in the TE mode resistivities and you can get negative phases um, near the shoreline. Uh, and in, in effect, the, um, the magnetic field propagates through the seafloor from land um, faster than the electric fields that propagate down to the ocean. So you get this non-causal negative phase as a result of the um, coast effect. Um, the classic coast effect that Chip Cox was interested in was a galvanic response associated with the electric field running up against the coastline. Um, and this is a TM mode phenomenon where the electric currents are perpendicular to strike. Um, and the electric fields basically get attenuated because they're because you get charge build up on the coastline. And what this does is, 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 a, is a, your E over B or apparent resistivity response ends up with a very depressed apparent resistivity. Um, but it leaves, because it's a galvanic effect, it leaves the phase uh, largely unmodified. And this is uh, basically associated with Chip Cox's boundary zone. Well, we recently discovered that if you get far enough out into the ocean, you do and see. You do, you do see this um, electric field start to leak down into the conductive parts of the mantle. And this vertical electric current is associated with uh, um, creates horizontal magnetic fields. And uh, you can get very negative phases at uh, relatively high frequencies. So here we see minus 180 degrees at uh, 10 seconds period in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, um, this was, um, Quite a nasty surprise when we first started making measurements in the middle of oceans with uh, passive margins and no subduction zones to attenuate this effect. So there are so there are basically three types of coast effect that you have to deal with. Um, if you're working in um, near shore uh, with a two-dimensional coastline, you can handle um, these with two-dimensional modeling. Um, but um, when you have three-dimensional coastlines, it gets challenging because your 3D models have to be fine enough to model your targets, but large enough to model coastlines thousands of kilometers away. And this right now, I think, is the, the frontier intractable problem for 
uh, marine MT in the deep oceans, but many, many groups are working on finite element uh, 3D modeling that, uh, that will be able to address this. So uh, recently, um, I put together a little portfolio of all the places we've been with the Scripps gear, uh, both for my work and uh, other people who had uh, um, used the gear uh, without me. Um, so I'll give you a quick Cook's tour. Um, it all started with hot spots and ridges, if you recall, both Chip and Martin Sinner um, headed to mid-ocean ridges um, for the first measurements. Um, this is um, um, some MT work uh, on these Pacific rise where we, uh, we, where we see mantle melting and upwelling. Um, this is in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean where we see, um, this is a slow spreading center and we see melt ponding at the base of the lithosphere. Um, this is the signature of the Hawaii plume. Uh, and this is some um, controlled source work in the Lao Basin that I uh, did with uh, the Southampton group, uh, Lucy McGregor and Martin Sinner, looking at hydrothermal circulation of hydrothermal systems in the, in the crust um, and several other places besides. Um, the other side of the plate tectonic conveyor belt is the subduction zones. And in the past decade or two, the National Science Foundation has got very interested in subduction zones and funded a number of studies um, um, in, in locations such as New Zealand and Central America. And this is a spectacular image that uh, Sam and Nath um, generated from CSEM off Nicaragua, where you can see reactivation of the normal faults as the plate bends and water going down into the crust. And you see the sediments being subducted and something going on here, which may be fluids released from the sediments or underplating the sediments in the uh, um, convergent margin. Um, this is a very early measurement we made in, uh, in Japan. Um, um, passive margins are sometimes of interest. Um, this is uh, off Morro Bay, California, where we're looking at uh, the San Andreas fault system. Um, this is a deep uh, crustal conductor off uh, um, Norway, which uh, we, uh, we think may be mafic cumulates in a rifted margin. And then this is a sedimentary basin just off San Diego where we've played around with a lot of instrument development. Um, resource exploration, of course. Um, the industry interest started with subsalt. Um, we um, were able to collect a data set off over the Scarborough gas field um, of Australia, uh, which is a challenging target because the, uh, the, the gas field resistor is sandwiched between this resistive silkstone and resistive basement. But we're to this day still playing with these data and learning how to deal with them. And um, even uh, offshore hydrothermal exploration has been recently of interest, um, some collaboration with CISESI, the, uh, the, the group down in Ensenada, just south of the border here in California, um, which has a fairly strong uh, magnetic group and uh, is funded for renewable resources offshore. Um, gas hydrates have been uh, ongoing interest because they are an interesting um, material that are not very well, not easily studied with seismics. Um, they are a frozen mixture of water and gas, usually methane, um, that sits in the seafloor. Um, this is a methane vent in the San Diego trough, which we've imaged to see a resistive gas hydrate body underneath. Um, this is gas hydrates in the Santa Cruz Basin, again, just off California here. And then this is uh, um, a Department of Energy drilling target in the Gulf of Mexico, where they're planning to drill this target down here, but we're seeing hydrates in actually a much shallower horizons, which uh, would be probably better drilling targets if that drilling program was going to continue, which it probably won't. Um, normal ocean lithosphere is of interest. This is an old data set that was uh, recently reinterpreted by um, um, the Hui group, Christine Chesley. Um, and we can see um, anisotropy in the uh, upper crust associated with the dikes and anisotropy in the upper mantle in, in, uh, associated with um, the shear fabric of the olivine grains. Um, this is a work in progress. Um, off across the Mendocino fracture zone where the age of the seafloor 
goes from 33 million years to six and a half million years. This has been done by um, Valeria Reyes Ortega um, students. Uh, and you can see a big step function in the, the, in the connectivity structure in the mantle. Um, groundwater and permafrost are um, a recent interests. Um, this, uh, this was the, um, some pioneering work done by Kelly Gustafson and the, um, the um, Lamont group. I mistakenly said Huey in the previous slide, it was Lamont. Um, and uh, this is offshore, the east coast of um, the US. Um, Eric Atias has done some really interesting work off the west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii, where he sees um, freshwater trapped by volcanic horizons. Um, and uh, Ross King, another one of my students, is doing some work offshore, San Diego, looking at the San Diego aquifer. This is all using equipment that was originally built, designed and built to study permafrost off Prigo Bay in shallow water. Some work with Dallas Sherman, um, one of my earlier students, so pioneered. And we've done other stuff too. Um, seafloor massive sulfides is the flavor of the month and will probably be um, um, the subject of EM research uh, and exploration going forward. Um, Alan Jones has um, pointed out that as we move from hydrocarbons to electricity, uh, we're going to need minerals. And uh, so a lot of uh, um, organizations are interested in the offshore mineral potential. And we've also started using the marine gear in, uh, in lakes, both in California and New Zealand to study uh, volcanic systems. So I'd like to finish up by showing you something that's actually new as opposed to all that other old stuff. Um, this is ongoing work that I'm doing with Kerry Key um, and you are basically the first to see it. Um, so way back in 2004, um, we collected uh, MT data over the East Pacific rise south of Clipperton um, transform fault. Um, this was funded by NSF as an MT project, um, and it produced this lovely image of mantle upwelling. Um, a couple of points to note is that the, the shape of this triangular upwelling is uh, consistent with passive upwelling rather than dynamic pressure driven upwelling. And um, the uh, onset of melting occurs deeper than the dry solidus, consistent with about 200 parts per million water in the mantle melt, um, which is not controversial today, but all the early models of uh, um, ridges had melting of around 70 kilometers, which is the dry solidus of, of Basso. Um, anyway, um, this was a fun cruise. It was a bit of a party. I noticed, uh, Chet Weiss is on the call. Graham um, gave his apologies because um, he's in the wrong time zone um, for this morning, California time. Um, but uh, we, we, we had the, quite a group. Uh, there's uh, the Jim Behrens and Kerry Key from Scripps, Graham Heinsohn and Goran Boren from Adelaide. Chet Weiss came along, a couple of students from uh, um, various places uh, joining us. Um, so it was a fun cruise and uh, we actually managed to collect some CSEM data while we were doing the MT. Um, this was using um, SUSE 200, Scripps Undersea Electromagnetic Source Instrument, 200 amp capability. This was um, my first um, chip, chips transmitter was retired a long, long time ago. Um, it was a very cumbersome thing. Um, ExxonMobil funded me to develop a new transmitter, um, which I did, um, and they immediately commandeered it for some um, commercial work off Angola, um, leaving me to build a second one, hopefully for this uh, East Pacific Rise project. And we had only had about two months to build a transmitter, and that's really not enough time. So I spent the first two weeks of this cruise holed up uh, in a lab with Kelly Callaway building a CSEM transmitter from basically a kit, which my engineers and technicians had put together for me. Um, and it nearly worked, but this battery that was supposed to power the system and get recharged during transmission wasn't being recharged by the circuitry. Um, in what I consider to be one of my 
more inspired engineering uh, decisions, um, I realized that a Macintosh power supply, which there were many on the boat, um, would actually, uh, has a broad um, voltage input and would work at 400 Hertz. And so I hot wired the transmitter to basically jump start as soon as the power was applied using this Mac power supply and start transmitting. So uh, we made it work in time towards the end of the cruise to tow basically one line of CSEM across the ridge while we still had the MT instruments out. And I towed them about a kilometer north of the, the, the line of instruments in order to get both the, um, the inline and crossline modes of the electric field, which at the time was considered to be important in uh, distinguishing uh, anisotropy. So um, the um, transmitter didn't have any of the navigation bells and whistles that we have today. Working out where it is in the ocean without even a depth gauge was somewhat challenging and uh, um, was one of the reasons why I've taken an inordinate amount of time to get around looking at these data again. Um, but here we are. The other thing that uh, um, makes um, interpreting these data um, nice nowadays is Kerry's Mare 2DE encode, which many of you probably know uh, and, uh, and, and probably love, like I do. It's a, um, uh, it's a lovely code to um, do joint MT CSEM inversion with. So here's a joint inversion of the MT and CSEM. This is the upwelling mantle coming up to a depth of around 25 kilometers. And we see um, lots of conductors in the crust. And although the magnetotolerics and the CSEM are compatible, um, the, um, the, the lack of sensitivity in the shallow part of the section of the MT um, makes a CSEM only inversion um, preferable for the shallow structures. And so um, we see a uh, conductor just under the ridge axis. Um, and we see conductors near the surface on both sides of the ridge axis. And um, this is all very interesting. And we can um, interpret these conductors in various ways. The seismologists see a thin axial magma lens um, about a kilometer deep right beneath the ridge axis and only a kilometer or two wide. Um, but they do infer that there's a mush zone of mixed um, crystals and melt beneath that uh, um, axial magma lens. Uh, and that, that corresponds basically to this conductor. But some seismologists think this mush extends all the way down to the moho, and we clearly see a base to it. We also see conductors off axis uh, in the uh, lower part of the crust, um, which the seismologists are also beginning to see with some of their um, experiments. Um, and the, um, the, the current paradigm for a mid-ocean ridge magma chamber is that there's deep hydrothermal circulation chilling the sides of the magma chamber and restricting it to a sort of boxy shape right under the ridge. Um, we are, we're not seeing that. We're seeing um, what looks like hydrothermal cooling in the, um, Layer, what seismologists call layer two, which are the dikes and uh, extrusive volcanics. But we're not seeing, we're seeing resistors, quite high resistors, a thousand millimeters or more um, here. So we're not seeing deep hydrothermal circulation. Uh, indeed, if you calculate a 1200 degree geotherm using Norm Sleep's um, um, model for um, mantle upwelling and, uh, and cooling, um, we, see the, we see our conductors um, are following almost uh, perfectly these, um, this, this isotherm, um, the melting isotherm. So this is entirely consistent with um, um, cooling associated with melt transport and uh, conductive diffusion. The, the, the hydrothermal cooling in the uh, volcanics does seem to stop at about 13 kilometers from the ridge. And there is a suggestion that there is some increasing connectivity associated with deeper hydrothermal circulation as faulting activates further away. And this is actually consistent with a very recent result of Sarah Myers, um, who inferred that um, the hydrothermal cooling was restricted to layer two, but uh, stopped at about 13 
kilometers away from the ridge. Um, this was done with uh, marine magnetics. Um, so um, the the other thing that this this the, the gabbros in the um, if you look at ophiolites, which are pieces of ocean crust put on land, um, the the lower crust of gabbros are are layered and they are ge geochemically different from the foliated gabbros that are in the uh, top part of the section. And so um, our observation that there are basically two different melting zones in the mid-ocean ridge system is consistent with the geochemistry and the texture of the uh, gabbros that are, that are seen. We can um, basically estimate melt from connectivity using a um, model of um, um, binary mixing law and the uh, measurements of uh, hydrated melt that have been made in the lab. And we get about 250,000 years of crustal formations worth of melt, um, which is equivalent to about 13 kilometers of crust formation, actually. Um, so this is a useful result. And we can also estimate, velocities are peaking out a little less than 10% in the magnet chamber. It's less in the lower conductor, but because there's so much, it's so much bigger, there's actually more melt down here than in the actual magnet chamber. And you're seeing, if you assume the water is about 300 degrees C, you're seeing about 10% um, velocity in the hydrothermal systems of the uh, top part of the crust. So this was a successful cruise. And uh, as for most of my successful cruises, we had a great party. Afterwards, you may recognize some of these characters. Um, a good time was had by all. Um, so going back to Chip, uh, he wrote in one of his early papers that um, marine air methods should be used to study spreading ridges, transform faults, subduction zones, island arcs, back up basins, um, and the asthenosphere. Uh, and we've been able to do um, all of that. Um, a cruise on the Charles Darwin collaboration with the uh, Southampton Cambridge group in 1989 was the last project that Chip participated in, in terms of Marini Air. And um, he went on to return to his old love of wave microstructure in the ocean sur surface, which he which he studied and literally until the day he died, he, he had a paper published uh, recently after his death on um, oil films and uh, surface microstructure. Um, maybe he trusted me to carry the method forward without him, um, but I suspect really he decided that the interesting, difficult work had been done and that it was time to move on to something else that was more interesting. So I'd like to thank all the people that I've had the pleasure to work with over my career, but especially Chip, who, who brought me to scripts and uh, taught me so much. Um, so that, Alan, concludes my talk, um, comfortably on time, I hope. Uh, if you want to open up the uh, um, floor for questions and discussion. Yeah, uh, absolutely brilliant, Steve. That was a wonderful overview, and it's... You know, I, I just hadn't appreciated it. I knew the little bits, I guess, but I hadn't seen it in one whole. The contributions of Marini M have been fabulous in so many areas. Perhaps while we're waiting for questions to roll in, could I ask you to speculate as to where you think Marini M might go? Because we have a, some young people, uh, some younger students. Where might the Marini M go over the next 20, 30 years? Everywhere. Basically, <laughs> um, any, any target that you use EM for on land is basically now being used offshore. So I think the, the, the groundwater is huge because without water we die and climate change is putting a lot of pressure on um, the terrestrial water systems. Um, as I mentioned, um, seafloor minerals, it, you know, it's a controversial idea dredging up minerals from the seafloor environment, but certainly, um, People are looking for them. And there's the idea that if we find them buried under sediments, um, it's, it's, it's less damaging to go for those than the ones that are sitting closer to the seafloor near the ridges that are supporting yeah. biological communities and so on. Um, and geothermal you know, is becoming um, of interest again as it's, it's, it's sort of called a renewable, even though really it's not. But um, 
the, there's, there's, there's some interest in offshore geothermal, and we, we all know that the yeah, methods are important for geothermal exploration on land. Volcanic hazard, um, um, we have, um, we've worked in uh, um, the Rotorua Lakes in New Zealand and uh, Mono Lake in California. There's some other lakes that the USGS wants to look at in California. And uh, Ted Bertrand just got funded as part of a very large um, New Zealand project to study White Island volcanic hazard. You may recall this is the island that famously killed a few tourists a few years ago. Um, so um, I think uh, I, the, you know, um, wind farms, this shallow EM system that we've built um, could be a good geotechnical tool for looking at uh, geological structure with a view to building these huge structures called windmills. Um, and uh, so I, I think, um, I, I think we, 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 we'd like to go back to the ridges. We've, the equipment's a lot better than uh, what was taken to the ridges in the early days. Um, and um, we're still studying subduction zones. I got a, I got a project funded recently to go and look at uh, the subduction zone off Tehuantepec, which is a seismic uh, gap and may either be about to create a very large earthquake that's going to kill everybody or may be benignly slipping for the rest of its future. And uh, EM is probably the right tool to work out which of those scenarios um, we're talking about. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish. I wish I was, you know, 50 years younger. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> yeah, I no, know the advances generally have been phenomenal. Well, one question I thought was, um, <clears throat> is it, what about um, the technology? I mean, is it, is it nonsense to think about using squids for long period and get much lower uh, noise levels? I think so. Um, you know, so squids need to boil off the gas, and that's difficult in the marine environment under pressure. Um, their noise levels aren't really much better than a good magnetometer, the induction coil magnetometers. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, we, we, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of floodscapes. If you look at my the curves that I showed, the uh, yeah. the, the noise floor of an induction coil sits below the magnetic field signal from the earth um, throughout the spectrum. And while they're noisier than flux gates at periods longer than about 300 seconds, right. they're, still, they're still measuring signal. We, right. we have an advantage over land that I didn't mention that the uh, temperature is constant. Right. So what gets you on land is that the, the, the sun comes up every day and heats all your coils and electronics and makes long period measurements a little tricky um, we routinely process MTR to 10,000 seconds using coils and probably could go longer if we were patient and collecting more data. So, um, yeah, I, 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 don't see, I don't see squids as a, a, a big advantage. I think we've, in terms of the equipment, uh, I've concentrated my career on logistics, making it possible to collect more data and reliably and faster. And in terms of the electric field measurements, we're up against the Johnson noise of copper. And in terms of the transmitter size, we're up against the, you know, the conductivity of seawater. And you, know, you, you don't want to start boiling it with your transmitter. So um, I, I, think, I, think, I think we've got, as far as the physics will um, give us. The advantage is making the instruments um, smaller, lighter, faster to deploy. Because the, you, know, you look back on the history of EM both on land and in the ocean, and the big gains have come from being able to go beyond single site MT to um, large numbers of sites. And um, we, you know, we routinely, you know, we, we, we go out and collect 160 sites in a few weeks now in the marine environment. Um, and, you know, and the land people are, are, are doing that sort of thing. Maybe it takes a little longer, but, um, you know, we're filling whole continents up. So that and the higher dimension inversion tools and Gary Egbert's processing codes, um, 
they've got us to a good place. Um, and I see, the, I see diminishing returns in the technology, but I see wonderful opportunities to go out and uh, measure geology. Right. Yeah, I yeah, I think, a, yeah. Okay, Jerry, Max. Jerry, yes. Hi. I have a technical question about your, the model you showed for, for your combined inversion. So if you go back to your, uh, the one with the interpre interpretation on it, that one. Huh? It's better seen on the other one. There, I don't actually see it that much. Yeah, there you can see it or there, it doesn't matter. So especially on the Eastern side, your conductors correlate very well with your receiver positions. Yes, so you have these little blobs that sit under your receivers. Have you made tests whether you can fill those in or not, or whether it's required that they are interrupted by something more or less resist? Sorry, less less conductive there. Not yet. Um, I've started some tests of the other parts of the model, and thanks for the suggestion. I'll do that just in case you review the paper. Um, the you're quite right. Um, we see station footprints. Um, and um, they, they're associated with the regularization, pushing, you know, if you, have a, if you have a place between receivers where you don't have any resolution, the cost function of the regularization um, may make it cheaper to push the resistor up between the sites than to make the horizontal conductivity continuous. And, you know, we occasionally see that Mod EM is famous for it because it regularizes against the starting model. Um, but looking at this, um, we actually have places where we've got good site density over these features. And so um, I will do the test that you suggest, um, but um, I, I'm going to predict that these are real. Uh, in this case, we, 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 we saw those and we thought exactly the same thing you did. Um, but then I looked at the site spacing and the data quality and decided uh, now nah, it looks as though we really, we really are sensitive uh, to these things. And it's a bit of a coincidence. So, you know, we, we don't see one here. We do see one. This looks like a site footprint, but then you get over here and you're seeing something different. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I think it's real, but I, I like the idea of running a test. Well, I think, I mean, I see this in, in sort of my inversions as well. So I think <laughs> it's a very common thing. It's, I mean, ModEM, you say, as you said, is maybe a bit stronger than others, but I think it's by no means restricted to that. I think just in this case, because you, you, you base a good bit of your interpretation on it, of course, it's always good yes, to, to make sure, yeah. But, it's certainly very interesting results. That's that's for sure. Yeah, a simple test to be to remove a few of the sites, do an inversion with say three or four sites missing, and see see what changes. Get, yeah. Whether you get the same structures back. Uh, we got a a comment from Mohammed Musan. If I could ask people to put questions in the q a rather than in the chat box please i think the reason is due to sensitivity analysis of sources tends to concentrate near surface and decay with depth yeah i think it's basically what we just said yeah. yes yeah exactly what steve right. just said is it's the mixture of the regularization and the strong yeah. sensitivity yeah. and the, uh, sensitivity around the around the side i think that's yeah another way of saying that yeah great well I, you seem to not have generated a lot of questions steve which means you you know the your talk was complete <laughs> <laughs> well, boring, boring stuff but, uh, no no it, it wasn't it was tremendous and i really appreciate the last slide with the uh, you know the um recognition of chip cox because i think a lot of young Younger people today, they kind of they don't know about the huge influence that people in the 70s had, the what I would call the, the gentleman generation, if you like. The, you know, people, yeah, Peter, Peter Vidal, Ulrich Schmucker, Chip Cox. Uh, yeah. Weaver. Um, I, I've 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 you know, so I, I'm not really complaining about being old. 
Um, I, I had the privilege of meeting these people and because EM is a relatively young field, um, I've, you know, I've been able to meet some of the founders. You know, I was looking for a photograph of Francis Bostick, um, who, who, who was famous for this thing called EMAP. Yeah. Um, and I discovered poking around on the web that he died this month. Oh um, dear. Oh. So oh, I um, the, you know, we're losing these people. Yeah. And I think it's important that they not be forgotten. Exactly. Exactly. No, and I certainly can say as somebody who's, if you want, so slowly transitioning from being a young scientist, <laughs> an old scientist, yes, that maybe when you sort of, when I was young, it was a bit like, okay, I, I do my own stuff. Yes, what do I need all these old guys? But I certainly have appreciated in the last few years sort of having sort of read a bit more about like the, the very beginnings and yeah, Schmucker, his studies in California, right. or what you were talking about today. I think it is very important to, um, go back to these things and a lot of phenomena I think have been described for a long time and we just sometimes have to rediscover them. Right. So the question is why does this spectrogram vary with time and um, this is because tidal cycle, tidal, tidal currents, you know, you have high tides and then um, the tidal cycle, the tidal amplitudes diminish and so this, this, is, a, this is an area of high tides uh, high, high amplitude tides, and they have a you know 24 hour cycle, and then the tidal um, cycle produces a less strong effect. In fact, we were doing some work in Spencer Gulf with the Adelaide Group, and we targeted what they call dodge tides, which are bits of the tidal cycle where you almost have no tides. I'll, I'll just read the question into the. The recording so people watching this later will know the question from uh, Mohammed was I have a question about the reason for the difference in frequencies from 27 December to the end of December and 1st January in the spectrogram okay well if there's no more questions then I guess we'll we'll thank Steve one more time absolutely brilliant and uh, I'll just grab the um, grab the screen from you Steve sure um, just just to remind people, uh, webinar next week, as, uh, coincidentally, one of the, we've seen Graham on one of Steve's slides. Um, coincidentally, uh, Graham Heinsen is speaking next week on uh, scale reduction studies, MT studies to link deep source regions to deposit scale for IOCG and gold deposits in Australia. And so on that, I'd like to thank Steve again and thank everybody for attending and see you all next week. Bye, Bye everyone.